Peter Fokal with us these days. He arrived yesterday and will be staying until tomorrow. There's plenty of time to talk to Peter in the next few days. Peter is, of course, a well-known reference through his uh, well-known textbook, for example, which uh, many of the students may have read in their young years. And uh, certainly everybody who is interested in the connection between uh, the climate on Earth and the sun must know about the irradiance from the sun. And again, Peter's work is uh, the standard reference in that field. He uh, has been involved uh, and has been working at the CFA in his early years, but has uh, set up his own company uh, more than 20 years ago. And uh, that is called Cambridge Instrumentation and uh, Re we call Research it like Instrumentation. That's what we call it. <laughs> yes. So the, the title is, I think, changed a little a few times. And uh, that's certainly another in interesting thing uh, that, at least in the US, you can actually get around by doing research within your own company. That's something which here in Europe we still have to learn. So today, Peter will be talking about uh, the question what irradiance will tell us about solar and stellar convection and magnetism. And you, many people may not, or some people may not, you should change your thing. Alex. Alex should change his uh, timer thing. Um, the irradiance um, is different from the luminosity of a star, and that's something which uh, I learned by accident only. Who, who of you knows what the difference is? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in the talk. In the we, will, we will cover this in the talk, otherwise ask in the end, of course. So um, after, the, after the Alex will fix the timeout thing, we'll be ready to go and to learn about the, the parts of the sun where the radiation actually actually mainly comes from. So, Peter, please. Well, first I want to thank Alex and the software group here for, <laughs> for rescuing me from, from disaster, because as usual, if you arrive with a PowerPoint presentation from the United States on a PC, it doesn't work on the local computers. It never works. Peter. So we spent the morning debugging the, the computer system. But, um, so I, w I wanted to show this picture first because I, this is a picture of the sun that most people are used to seeing. You know, the sun is pictured here at a lay layer in its atmosphere where there are changes occurring. Should I wait until you? Was it the end? But it's. Um <laughs> okay, so th this is the active sun. This is the sun that you're used to seeing in pictures, which is changing on time scales of seconds to hours to days. And this is the sun that gets most of the publicity. But it's very easy to forget that underneath this, this active layer, there's a sun which has enormous inertia. What I mean by that is that uh, if you stop the nuclear energy generation of the sun today, it would take about 10,000 years before the, the best radiometers, which are measuring the, the total irradiance of the sun, could tell the difference. <coughs> you know, something like a resolution of a few parts in 10 to the fourth. It would take about 10,000 years for the sun to shrink a few kilometers and to become a few degrees cooler. You would have to have very specialized instrumentation to actually detect that difference. So we're dealing with a star which has, in terms of thermal time scales, is extremely slow moving. And the reason it's important to point that out is because to understand the luminosity variation of stars, you have to take into account not only the short time scales, but also this enormously longer time scale that has to do with the, with the rate of relaxation of the star. So uh, let's move on to the next. You can cycle those down here. How do you cycle this? With this one here? Yes. Yes. Oops. So this slide shows what we actually have learned uh, about the, t the solar irradiance variation. And just to, to explain the terminology, the difference between the luminosity. The luminosity is, of course, the total, radi the total radiative output of the star in, into all of space, whereas the irradiance is the flux of radiation that you're picking up above the Earth's atmosphere with an instrument of per square centimeter per second. So uh, this is what this is the quantity that we're actually measuring over here, 
with radiometers which are black in the cavities, uh, which are flown on spacecraft. And they, they accept all radiation from the ultraviolet through the, through the visible and into the infrared through about three microns. And so what you see here are uh, time series which go back to 1980, so three solar cycles. And the, um, <coughs> the data are the same in both time series, but they have been reconstituted by two different groups, by, by Richard Wilson at JPL over here and by uh, Klaus Froehle from Switzerland over here. So you see there are differences between the two. But the main things are, are, are independent of who, who reconstitutes the data. The main thing is that the sun is about 0.1% brighter when the activity is high. You can see these are the, the peaks of activity. And also this, this high frequency hash that you see here is not instrumental noise. That's, that's real variation of the solar irradiance on a time scale of the rotation of the sun. That has a peak to peak of about 0.3%. So the, uh, after about 20 years of reduction of data and, and modeling analysis, it's pretty much agreed now that the, the reason for this is the obvious reason. This, this variation is caused by changes in the projected area, the magnetic structures in the sun, which are the dark sunspots over here, and also, uh, I guess, high technology. Uh, that you can see the dark sunspots and the bright, these are the bright magnetic faculae. And the, the presence of these magnetic faculae explain this, this, this interesting point that the sun actually gets brighter at high activity levels instead of being dimmer, which you expect from, from a larger number of sunspots. But the, the holy grail of this whole subject now is are there other influences on the total irradiance besides these magnetic structures of the photosphere? Because if you look at this variation, it's too small to affect climate. So we, the, the climate community is very interested in putting this kind of variation into the global climate models to see if you can explain, for instance, the Little Ice Age in the 17th century. And the answer is, with this kind of variation, you cannot explain it. So there's still the question, could the sun's luminosity uh, be changing enough on centennial time scales by mechanisms which are perhaps negligible on this time scale but become dominant when you're looking longer? So to, uh, to make progress on this, you really need to remove this, this what you might consider <coughs> noise, this, this effect of these surface structures. And that removal would seem to be trivial because we have plenty of pictures of the sun. You can measure the areas of these structures and you can measure the contrast. But in fact, it, it's, a much, it's a very non-trivial problem because in fact, in order to remove these structures, you'd have to image them in the same wide band of radiation which is being used to measure this irradiance variation on the left, okay? And until recently, if you flip that instrument, there, there really wasn't any instrument which can image astrophysically or the sun or, or any other object in, in total wideband radiation. So what you're really asking for over here is photospheric imaging with a spectrally flat response over this wide, response range, which is, which is that which is used by the radiometers. So we actually, de we, we actually de uh, developed an instrument called the Solar Volumetric Imager, and it has 30 centimeter aperture telescope, you can see it over here, and it was flown on a balloon to about 130,000 feet on a couple of occasions very, quite successfully. And th these are, this is an example of the first, one of the first pictures of the sun now in total light not in the green or the red or the blue or whatnot, but actually in total light. So the, the proportion of these contrasts to the, to the average brightness of the sun is that exactly in the same proportion as their contribution to the, to the luminosity of the sun. Right? So you can remove these, these, these perfectly and uh, get an idea if there's for other variations beyond that. So if you do that, if you make a model using uh, you compare the radiometry from Klaus Froelich's re reconstruction, which is the blue curve over here, going back uh, until 1978 or so, 1980 in this case, uh, the, the model using the, these structures on the surface is pretty much tracking the observations pretty nicely, at least on annual averages. Except over here, the, when the sun went very quiet a few years ago during the, the, big, the big minimum we had, the the irradiance variation dipped significantly 
below what you would expect from these indices. So uh, some parts of the community said, ah, there's new physics on the sun. And that the, you know, that in order to understand the, the cooling of the sun in the Little Ice Age, and its effect on the Little Ice Age, we have to take into account um, physical processes that are not part of this model. But another inter interpretation is that the relationship between the microwaves, which are used here, the chromospheric indices or the magnetograms or whatever, that you use to think this model is no longer linear, that you're actually <coughs> in a range where the, the effect of this, of this uh, magnetic, uh, very quiet period we had is much more serious for the total irradiance contribution of the flux tubes than it is for the microwaves, than it is for the chromospheric indices. So uh, I don't want to dwell on this too much because I know many of you are not really um, perhaps entirely uh, have, have the background to, or the interest to follow all the details of this. But in the next slide, we, uh, we can see that there is, there is some reason actually to believe that this nonlinearity might, might occur, which is that you can, there's a class of structure that we first imaged back in the 1990s actually in the near infrared which are bright in the chromospheric indices in calcium K over here, but in the near infrared and also in white light, uh, if you look closely enough, but in the, in the near infrared it's much more obvious, you can see structures like this which are, which are dark in the near infrared and still bright in calcium K. So if you have a model which has a linear relationship between the bright, brightness in calcium K over here, or plagia there over here, and, uh, and, the, and the contribution to the total irradiance, then the then these structures will be less effective in this size range than they are as they get smaller. Right? So the, the main point of all this is that it offers some hope that as the sun, that the, uh, the basic model that we have, that the, the sun's luminosity variation, even at its lowest levels of magnetic <coughs> activity uh, during the modern minimum in the 17th century, that if you keep removing flux from the sun, you get into a regime where the flux tubes that you're removing are so small that their contribution to the luminosity is more important than their contribution to the chromospheric indices like, like, like the microwaves. And so you get into a nonlinear part of the model where you can explain the dip the prolixes in the, in the radiometry and you might actually produce a luminosity variation. Cool, a cooling of the sun in the 17th century which is consistent with modern photometry and which is predictable and which actually could drive uh, climate models enough to, to actually explain a little ice age. So moving ahead here. So let's let's look. Th th this is more from the point of view of the uh, the behavior of the irradiance and its impact on climate. But in terms of astrophysical implications, what what have we learned? What's what some examples of problems that we've um, learned a bit more about by studying irradiance variation? So. One is this classical problem, which goes back to the time of Ludwig Biermann Bier in 1941, which, which is where does the, the, the heat, which is stopped from emission by a sunspot, where is it actually going and what implications does it have for the energy balance of the star? And Bier Biermann said, well, here's a nice picture. I apologize, this is not an SST picture. It's from the, the latest from the big telescope at Big Bear right now, but I, 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 I couldn't resist. So, uh, so the question is, where, where does all the heat that's missing from this go? And uh, the idea at that time was that the sunspot is just a thermal plug and the heat somehow goes somewhere else. Well, well, Gene Parker wrote a series of papers actually in 1974, which points out that if you put a thermal insulator on top of a convecting layer or a conducting layer like a stove, then there should be a, bright, a brightening around the insulator which if you put the, the thermal diffusivity for, for the convection zone into it, or for the, for the upper layers of the convection zone into it, you should have bright rings which would be so bright that they would knock your eye out. It would be 20%, 30% bright rings. So Gene said that we, clearly the idea of Biermann is wrong, and that in fact, what's more likely is that you are promoting overstability in the magnetic field, and you're generating a huge flux of alphane waves, which are going into the corona. And these are carrying the missing, the missing energy in the sunspot. But the problem was at the same time, I was at Harvard at the time, and we were observing with the Skylab with the first EUV observations of the corona. 
the ones that had angular resolution. We can see that sunspots like these over here, when they were imaged in radiations near the peak of the plasma cooling curve, you know, around 100,000 degrees, these sunspots, which are dark and visible, are the brightest emitters in the sun in the UV in these transition region lines. And so it just seemed very, very implausible that this region, which is 10 times cooler than the surrounding corona, is the place where you have this enormous flux of alpha amine waves coming from the sunspot. So that made the, the idea a little bit less attractive. And, but what really turned it around was at that time, Hank Spruitt, who is at uh, Garshing now, was a graduate student near Holland. And he did a, the same calculation as Parker, only he put a depth dependence of the thermal diffusivity into his calculation. And he also took into account the, the radiative leak from the size of the flux tube into the, into the flux tube. And he went from, by doing that, he went from a, a, a heating by the sunspot underneath the sunspot, as shown by this curve, to something that looks like this. And that coincided very closely with observations we were doing it a, bit, a little bit later at Pitt Peak that showed that the bright rings around sunspots that you see typically are maybe 0.1%. If, if you see them at all, they're about 0.1%. So, uh, so that means that the, the, the problem that Parker was posing went away, and it's in its original format, but it really didn't solve the problem where the, what happened to the heat after was, it, was, it was put out into the convection zone. So if you show the next slide, the, you know, the question was still, you, you had this heat there, and does it reappear after a few days, or what, what happens to this huge heat flux? And that's where the radiometry came in. That the radiometry showed us something that was, was unable to be shown by photometry. Because the photometry could never really say that the, that the heat perhaps was being thrown into a bright ring, which was very large and very low amplitude. But the radiometers showed that if you model using the brightness, you know, the, the darkness of the sunspot in this area, and compare with the actual dip in the radiometry, the, the, the actual radiometry here, with the dark curve and a reconstruction from the photometry with the bright curve, you can see that there's extremely good correspondence, which means that almost all the heat is being stored up in the sun on time scales which are much longer than the time scales of the sunspot, you know, many, much more than a few months. So at that time, with Hank, we did a time-dependent calculation of the heat flow around a the thermal plug, and we found this very interesting result that in fact the block heat, block heat is not only redistributed in an overturning time of a few days, but it's actually, it's actually stored in the convection zone for the radiative relaxation time of the whole convection zone. All right? And that's of the order of 100,000 years. So the, the, the storage of this heat is almost perfect, which explains why this correspondence is perfect also. And it, this has sort of interesting implications for all sorts of uh, calculations, dynamo calculations also, because uh, some, some of the dynamo uh, modelers have gotten into the business of irradiance studies and, you know, to pursuing the effect that dynamo variations in a star could have on its, on its heat flux. And, of course, if you don't do those calculations with a radiative upper boundary, it's very easy to come with ridiculous results. You know, that there's, there's no question that if you are putting energy into a magnetic field, that to conserve energy, less of it has to be coming out of the luminosity. So on those grounds alone, on first, on first law grounds, you'd expect that, that when the sun is more active, that it should get dimmer all right, to some level. But in fact, if you put in this thermal time scale, you can see that, that in fact, any such variations would be smoothed out enormously by this 100,000 year time scale, so they would be damped by about a factor of 10,000. In fact, what really happens is that here's the sunspot, you, you turn it on, the heat actually gets fanned down into the convection zone, and as I said, it's, it's, it's stored for you know, the order of 100,000 years. So this is an example of how you, that if you do a calculation, not on the back of an envelope, but properly, you come up with qualitatively different results. And at the time, we were talking about this at lunch, that you know, some, pretty much everybody in the solar community said this result cannot possibly be right because you can see convection around sunspots and the granulation, which overturning time of this is 
a few hours, how could you possibly be keeping this energy in the sun for 100,000 years? And the answer basically is that a star is a very bad radiator compared to its diffusive power. It, you can diffuse the energy much more rapidly and you can radiate it from the surface. So the next, uh, so another question that's, that sort of comes out of this that's of interest to dynamo modeling is this, this question always is what, what is the, uh, the eddy diffusivity of magnetic fields? And normally this is obtained in some way by at least at the surface of the sun, measuring the, the characteristic uh, scale and velocity of magnetic elements on magnetograms such as you see over here. These are structures and they're tracked in their, in their kinematical motions. And from that you get L and you get V and then you calculate the diffusivity. And of course, there's always a problem of extrapolating the, this down into convection zone. But it's worth comparing these diffusivities that you get from this quite independent measurement, which is if you do this calculation that Hank first did of the, of the brightness or the bright rings, this is a calculation we did, but we did it in a, in a time-dependent way. So it takes into account that after the sunspot comes up, it takes a while for the bright ring to develop. But basically, we got the same result, that the bright rings ought to be around about, about the, the amplitudes that we actually observe in the Kitt Peak. So using, using the, the observational values for this and comparing them with these models, you get diffusivities, which are actually about an order of magnitude lower at, at the photosphere than the ones that you get from from this kind of uh, kinematical representation of diffusivities. So, uh, as I say, in, in both cases, you still have this leap of faith of what these values do as a function of depth in the sun. But it's interesting to calibrate them at least at the photosphere. So another question that comes out of this is, uh, you know, the, the standard people always ask, well, what are these faculae? They are bright. And this is mysterious because the same strength of magnetic field in sunspots makes sunspots dark. So what's happening here? And this is already, again, something that Hank addressed in his PhD thesis. And he pointed out, he, he, he showed very elegantly that uh, the basic phenomenon that happens in any flux tube is that you're replacing some of the plasma pressure with magnetic field pressure. This is true in any flux tube. So you get a cavity, here's your magnetic field over here, <coughs> threading up through the photosphere, here's the photospheric surface. And so you have a kilogauss field which makes a depression in the photospheric pressure, and therefore in the density and opacity. And this makes it possible for radiation to escape from the, from the brighter walls of this flux tube, and this is what causes, this is what gives you a tendency to brightness. Now the other, the other part of the energy balance is that the, the uh, heat is coming from the, from the below the flux tube and the magnetic field for the reasons that Biermann pointed out already in 1941 the inability of, of overturning convection in this magnetic field reduces the, the, the convective efficiency <laughs> along the axis so you have two competing effects you have the, the, the cooling by the by the inhibition of axial convection and you have the heating from the sides and it's this is what Heng showed is that it's very simple to show that that as you if you have a very small flux tube then this effect which goes as the area the cross-sectional area becomes less important than this and as you make it bigger then this becomes relatively more important and you get a sunspot okay so this is that was a beautiful result and now the question is is this compatible with the radiometry because the radiometry says that when you have a facula in the sun the sun gets brighter. The net effect of the luminosity goes up. Of the fact that the luminosity goes up. And on the first, on first reaction, you might say, well, is that reasonable? Because if you have, if the facula is bright because there's more radiation from the walls, wouldn't that just cool the part of the sun around the facula? So in fact, the net effect would be balanced by the cooling around it. But if you do the, the time-dependent heat blocking calculation in reverse, namely instead of putting a blocking in, you put a heat leak in, basically a thermal short circuit, you find that there's almost no, just like there's almost no sunspot bright rings, there's almost no cooling around here. The heat, the heat <coughs> comes very efficiently because of the radial increase in heat, in heat conductivity down into the sun. It 
becomes very efficient from the bottom. So that's some problems. So the, the observation that the that there's a net luminosity increase by these and irradiance increase by the flux by the facula is is consistent with the model that Hank came up with. So now if you're not confused already, this will make you confused for sure. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the sort of the hottest new result in this irradiance field right now has a bearing on this question of how stable is the convective efficiency of a star <laughs> and its photospheric <clears throat> capacity over time scales of the magnetic cycle. And uh, recently, uh, the, the observations from an instrument called SIM on the source mission that is being operated from the University of Colorado came up with this rather perplexing result that if you look at the sun's output in the UV, 300 to 400 nanometers. And they also have channels that go further in the UV than that. The sun is cooling as it gets less active. This is between year 2004 and 2007. So this is a time scale of about three years. So the sun is cooling, and that, that's OK. That's the way everybody has, already, has always seen the measurements behave. But the thing that was really strange was that in the, in the, in the, in the visible between 400 nanometers and 691. While the sun is getting less active, it's getting brighter. All right, and so again, uh, a number of people saying that this is the end of physics. <laughs> we have to start from the very beginning again. <laughs> but actually, if you think about it, it's a it's almost a trivial consequence of what of this model of, of Hanks of the of the flux tubes because what is really happening is that if you look at the photospheric temperature, this is the, the inside of the sun and this is the outside, so it's, this is the drop off of temperature down to the temperature minimum in the photosphere. As the sun is getting less active, you're going to a higher temperature gradient. That's, that's the outcome of this, this, this observation. So this is moving up in temperature, this is moving down in temperature, so you're going to a steeper temperature gradient. And this is consistent with what what is in the, in the flux tubes, that the reason that a facular flux tube is bright in the high levels of the atmosphere is because it has a flatter temperature gradient. It has one that looks more like <coughs> this one over here. All right? and so as, you, as the sun gets less active and you take more and more facular flux tubes away, you would expect that the temperature gradient would get steeper because you have less of flat, you know, the flat temperature gradient. And in fact, that, that seems to be, if you put the numbers into it, the, the fractional change in the area of the flux tubes and the fact that uh, the, the, the temperature gradient in the flux tubes is about 20% less, then you get about a 1% change in the temperature gradient, which is what the University of Colorado experiment is showing. So I think that, once again, it's OK. Physics is all right. You can sleep. <laughs> the next flux tube, the next picture shows um, actually a result that bears on this that it's one of these useless results when we first got it back in the 1980s and all of a sudden it has become very relevant which is that uh, the this lower temperature gradient in the faculae actually can be measured directly you don't have to do any modeling at all really and it's simply from the fact that the sun's opacity in the photosphere which is dominated by H minus changes quite quite strongly between the green and the near infrared. There's about a 30 kilometers difference in the depth that you can penetrate into the sun in these two different continuum pass bands. So you, if you take simultaneous images of the sun at these two, these two wavelengths, and if you add them, nothing very interesting happens. But if you subtract them, then all of a sudden in the continuum, you can see these facular structures. I don't know if you can see it pretty well from there. Um, this is all. This is all photographed or, or scanned from an old J article. So you see, you see a lot of the silk screen process in these pictures. But you can see all these dark structures which normally aren't visible if you're looking in a map of the brightness temperature of the surface of the sun. But here you're looking at a map of the temperature gradient because you're looking at the, these two different heights in the atmosphere. And you can see that these correspond quite nicely with the various strongest structures in this magnetogram. Sun. So this agrees with the models quite nicely. Now the, uh, the, the problem with this, this 
this model, it seems, is that there's another way of measuring the temperature gradient in the photosphere, and that is by looking at the limb darkening of the sun. You know, if you if you scan across the sun <coughs> with a with a, you know, with a detector like this, you can see that the sun is about 40 percent less bright at the at the limbs that it's in the center. And the reason, of course, is that there's a temperature gradient in the atmosphere that we're sampling differently at different mid eccentric angles. And if you add 100 scans like this, you can beat down the granular noise and the five-minute oscillation. You can get actually curves that are relatively smooth. And people have been doing this at, at Kitt Peak. We, we did a, quite a bit of this back in the 1980s. And you can do it quite precisely. And Pearson Slaughter did it, and Labs and Neckel, and other people. And they were looking, we were all looking for variations of this limb darkening with the activity level of the sun. And the answer was, to amazing precision, there is none. And that's, that seems to be at variance, if you just flip this, with this result from the Colorado experiment. Because if you, if you ask yourself, what is the sensitivity, theoretically, of the limb darkening to a temperature gradient on, in the photosphere, we should be able to answer that in 2010, after all the work that's been done on it. And it's not a, still not a trivial problem, because of the models that are going but the, it looks like the observations are down here, that if you plot the, the, uh, the difference in the limb darkening as a function of the mid eccentric angle, you get points that, that fall down here at the level of below 0.1% variation over the solar cycle. And if you calculate what should be occurring, if you have the temperature gradient <coughs> change that is seen by the University of Colorado instrument, it should be 10 times that. Okay. So the question is, if this model I just described to you is right, how come you're not seeing the limb darkening change? And I think the answer to that is, is this, that, that the limb darkening change, if this explanation I just gave you is right, is occurring inside cavities, which are the faculae. All right? And, and you, the fact that there, there are more of these, these, <coughs> these cavities, you cannot see, you cannot actually see the temperature gradient in these cavities, because they, uh, because they, you can't you can't see it at limb distances greater than about uh, a heliocentric angle of about seven degrees. You're actually not able to to see this atmosphere at all because the the, the gradient change that I'm talking about is occurring between these two lines. So, the the University of Colorado experiment is is seeing this change because they're seeing it as a uh, on the disk as uh, using a technique that uses sampling in a wavelength. But in the, in the limb darkening, you're, you're not using a sampling in a wavelength. You're using a sampling in geometrical and heliocentric angle. You're looking at slant angles. So the, the effect that is, is there, this, this limb darkening, this, this, uh, this change in the temperature gradient, is actually obscured in the fact of the flux tubes. And again, it seems to be quite consistent with this this relatively simple explanation. Okay. Now, here's, here's, uh, here's actually the, probably the, the point that's most interesting to the dynamo community, which is that uh, the question is, does the spatial scale of emerging magnetic fields, does it depend on the dynamo's efficiency? The spatial scale, in other words, if you're erupting flux on the <coughs> sun, are you seeing larger flux tubes, larger cross-section flux tubes, uh, as or is the is the spectrum the spatial spectrum of these flux tubes changing as a function of the efficiency of the dynamo? And uh, this this the thing that has a bearing on this is that if you plot the TSI increase the irradiance variation uh, as a function of the activity of the sun against the sunspot number over here, this is something that Salaki and, and uh, Libby did back many years ago. You see that. The curve, you would expect the curve to get to be going in the direction of the sun getting brighter and brighter. Because I, sh I showed you before that when the sun has more sunspots, then it's actually brighter. So you expect this curve to be going up, up, up. But it's, it's, it's surprising that after beyond a certain activity level, the sun actually starts to get dimmer again. Right? And the reason for that is, is almost certainly something that we discovered actually before this plot was made which is if you plot the areas of faculae, these, uh, these magnetic structures which are quite fragmented, against the areas of sunspots, which are larger monolithic flux tubes, 
to find the same effect. As the sun gets more active, first of all, the two are increasing together. The fragmented fields are increasing in the same proportion as the, the monolithic fields. But then as you get to a certain point, it turns over, and the sun begins to produce a larger fraction of its total flux in big flux tubes and a small fra smaller fraction in the, in the more fragmented ones. And this is actually consistent with what you see on other stars. There, there's, if you look at stars that are more active than the sun, some of these have sunspots, which are 20% of the area of the whole star, you know, which, which is an order of magnitude larger than anything you see on the sun. So if you get a star which is spinning more rapidly and is younger, and more active, you, you have this tendency of seeing uh, the, the shift in the spatial wave number of the dynamo to a direction where more of the flux is coming out in fewer, larger flux tubes. So I think that th this is actually an, a constraint that as dynamo models become non-axisymmetric, really should be included as a constraint besides the Hale-Nicholson flyer de Vos and so on. That you have, you do have a tendency to produce um, larger scale fields. Looking at those uh, dots, I would actually think you would have a saturation indication of a saturation rather than a wave indication. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the it depends exactly how you plot it. But I, I forget what the chi square here is. Whether you know what the, what the what the significance level of the turnover is compared to the saturation. But the main thing is that the curve is not linear. Uh, and the units are the same when you look for AF and AS. So the slope yeah. is really bigger than one in the beginning. Oh yeah, no, the, the, this, oh yeah, no, the, the, this is, uh, the area covered by faculae is at least an order larger than, a magnitude larger than it is for sunspots. Yeah, right, and until you reach the saturation point, yeah. it then becomes more comfortable. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, these are, that's right, these are the same units. So it gets, well, sorry, th th these are white light faculae, all right? So these are in the photosphere. At that level, it, it's understandable that the scales are the same. If you were doing this with plages in the calcium K, those are larger. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how important it is that the scales are the same. The, the fact is that the, <coughs> that the, that the curve is nonlinear. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could simply be a um, problem that what do you count in the end as uh, sunspots of that phys physics-wise, uh, the manifestation of magnetic fields is uh, more going into sunspots rather than faculty for strong fluxes. Yeah. Well, you know, the the all that's really being shown in this curve is that the the structures. You, you don't have to worry, as we said before, too much about the physics of the fact what's making it bright or dark. It just says that if you plot it here instead of AF. You've plotted here things, things whose spatial scale is between around 1,000 kilometers, and here flux tubes whose, whose spatial scale is more like 10,000 kilometers, mm -hmm. and leave out of it completely whether it's mm -hmm. dark or bright. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's really it's really a what we really are trying to do next with this is turn this into a spatial yeah. uh, spectrum of mm -hmm. magnetic fields and so on. And th this is sort of illustrates what you're talking about here. I mean, I apologize for this picture the way it came out here. But you can see this is the biggest sunspot that was observed in about 100 years from Greenwich. This is 1947. And this is the same sunspot when it gets to the wind. And the thing is, I'm not sure you can see it very well, but the, the faculae which are seen around this sunspot are just in a very restricted area. So the fact that these, this spot is 10 times the size of a normal spot in the sun is not producing faculty that are 10 times as large. So now here, here's another, I'm, I'm changing topics here very quickly, but uh, th this is actually a related issue, which is how, how likely is it, if you're, if you're doing dynamo modeling of the sun, how likely is it that the sun could have been hyperactive, in other words, much more active even than it has been in, uh, in our record, in our recent record of, of solar activity, if you go back 10,000 years. And Sammy Solanke and other people have, have, have wrote a paper in Nature, I think, uh, here in 2004, which, where they reconstructed from carbon-14 the, 
level of activity, what the sunspot number should have been going back to the last ice age. And the conclusion, the main conclusion of the paper is that the sun is actually at least as active now, as it has been in 1957, as it ever has been in 10,000 years. And so that, that's sort of an interesting thing from, from, you know, from, dynamo, from the point of view of dynamo modeling. And the, the problem with this kind of approach is that the, the radioisotope studies are working on a model where the radioisotopes are produced by the shielding, that the modulation of the radioisotopes is produced by the variable shielding of the heliospheric magnetic fields on the galactic cosmic ray flux. So you have galactic cosmic rays that are coming in from well outside the solar system, and their ability to, to hit the Earth and produce carbon-14 and beryllium-10 is modulated by the heliospheric field. But it neglects completely the sun's own production of cosmic ray particles. And for normal activity levels, that's OK, because the, the product the production from the sun is, is, is not very large. But clearly, you can see that at some point, as the sun gets more active, if the sun got twice as active as it was in, in, in cycle 19, uh, the, the effect of the sun's cosmic rays is going to be, become more and more important. And actually, at some point, the curve will change sign. That as the sun gets more active, you're going to have more, more radioisotope production, not less. And so the, you, from that, you would expect that using radioisotopes to put an upper limit, th this is OK as long as you're not doing upper limits, but putting an upper limit for radioisotopes <coughs> is dangerous. And when I first suggested this, um, they, Samis, Sami did not think that was really very useful because, because uh, they, everybody knew that the production of the, of the solar particles was not going to have much effect. But then Usoskin, who works with Sami, who's really the guy who did this calculation in Finland, I think it is, redid the calculation for beryllium-10 for the biggest particle events in the sun and found out that, in fact, at least for beryllium-10, perhaps not for carbon-14, that even, even big events that we see now in the sun can account for as much as 30% of the total cosmic ray flux that we've seen. Okay. So we're, we're yeah. You know, you know, so yeah, so so we're actually, you know, we're we're not that far from a tipping point. And the thing is that the you know that the, the cosmic ray production from big flares is such an unknown and is such a nonlinear function of the size of the flare that you know it's impossible to say that if, if we had a sunspot number not of two hundred as we had in, in nineteen fifty seven, but if we had three hundred or four hundred you know, whether in fact the dominant term could in fact be the, the SEP production. So th th this kind of a thing is, one has to be careful. So the last topic here is, um, you know, to what extent can we see back, if we're looking at the dynamo behavior of the sun, if we wanted to go really far back, 650 million years, for instance, uh, the piece of evidence that's, that's, that we have right now, which is kind of tantalizing, is actually something that was pointed out by an uh, Australian <coughs> geologist in the 1980s, this guy George Williams. And he pointed out that uh, there's this Elatina var formation. These, these are sedimentary layers that are, late, that are visible near a highway in southwestern Australia. This is not something that's very, you know, that's, that's very high tech. You can drive along the highway and see these. And he, he did an analysis of these. And, and had a whole, for, for many years, he became sort of a, a famous figure in this whole field of paleo reconstruction of the sun. And he was invited to speak all over the United States. And his, his, his model was that these are 11 year, quasi 11 year cycles between here and here. And if you plotted them out, you know, with the microdensitometer, you could see the thickness of the lamina. And these are sort of so cycles of the 11 year cycle when the sun was 15% younger, all right? But then all of a sudden, he said, no. I changed my, changed my model. These are, actually, these are actually monthly effects uh, caused by a tidal effect that this was, his original model was that this was a glacial lake, a periglacial lake, which was very sensitive to climate. And now the model changed to something which was uh, near, it was on an estuary near the ocean. You know, you were affected by the tides. 
So all of a sudden, he, he went from being famous to not being famous. <laughs> this happens to people. And, uh, but now, uh, if you show the next slide, all of a sudden, he may be famous again because uh, a bunch <laughs> of very good paleomagnetic guys from Caltech happened to be working on these same VARGs in Australia near the highway. And they found out that, that Williams was probably right the first time because they, they were able to get into the VARG layer and measure the orientation of a, mag of a geomagnetic field and its rotations, you know, if you're in the thickness of the VARG layer. And they see rotations which are impossible to have been, to, to have occurred if the VARG layer represented uh, the much shorter time scale of the second interpretation. That in fact, the first interpretation that you're looking at 30,000 years of these VARGs seems to be correct. So they've, they've gotten, their, they've asked for money from, from the National Science Foundation and NASA to go back, and this is the Caltech guys back there with their drilling platform, and they're drilling for these VARGs again. And so we may actually have some inf information from this if, you know, if subsequent studies. Uh, this guy, Kirschman, is a very famous paleomagnetic guy. So that's, that's pretty much it. And the uh, summary here, so the solar luminosity is modulated by these by magnetic structures in a thin photospheric layer. It's, it seems, you know, that everywhere you look on the sun, everything that's interesting is always happening in thin layers. You know, the, 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 the corona would be very boring because it's electromagnetic. Relaxation time is tens of thousands of years. These flares could not possibly happen and things like that. Now, nothing in the corona could really happen if it weren't happening in reconnecting layers, which are a few hundreds of meters thick, perhaps. So everything we don't understand, we put into a thick and thin layer. <laughs> so the luminosity also is happening, the luminosity modulation is happening in, because of effects in a very thin layer, a few hundred <coughs> kilometers thick in the photosphere. And this, this stuff we've already talked about, but it's, is it possible to have variations of the luminosity on time scales which are, uh, relatively short, but do not arise from the surface magnetic structures, which can we beat this, this enormous damping by the rate of relaxation time. It's possible that if you use advection of, of entropy with meridi meridional circulations, for instance, that you can get around it, but it's not really clear at all right now. So uh, this anomalous dip of the irradiance around 2008 seems to have a relatively may well have a relatively mundane explanation, which, on the other hand, could have very interesting implications for our ability to connect solar activity to the cooling of the Earth in the Little Ice Age. And then there's this business of the mag magnetic diffusivity that maybe we can learn something from the spot, spot from the bright rings that we measure around sunspots. And uh, this, this, this issue of the, of the Lingard thing and the temperature gradient of the sun seems to be, probably can be explained in a way that, that also doesn't require any physics. And the, uh, this, is the, this is the item that I mentioned might have the most direct impact on the dynamo modeling, the fact that the, that the sun seems to produce larger scale fields as it gets more active, other stars also. And that there's business that one, one mustn't neglect the possibility of a more active sun in the past. We'll, we'll learn something from these large possibly. So I think that's, have I covered enough subjects? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Any questions? <clears throat> Actually, now when you say the, instead of saying, as you've heard before, that you produce fewer of the smaller spots as the magnetic field becomes stronger, uh, it's plausible as you put it now when you say these structures simply become bigger as the dynamo saturates and that's certainly observed and then I, yeah. we can discuss but uh, is that actually do you think that is really well, the right you know there, there's an alternative wording? explanation of this saturation of, of the irradiance that I showed there uh, which is and also of the of the of the change in the ratio of the sunspots to factor mm -hmm. And that's something that was uh, suggested a few years ago by Wang and Chile. And it simply is in the context of their diffusion model of magnetic fields on the surface of the sun. 
which is that if you if you have if you have um, Frequency fields and then sunspot. I have sunspot frequency fields. I see it. So, oh, I should I should have drawn the other way around. I should have frequency fields and that's why over here. This is negative. Then the sunspot over here. So if you have a higher, as you have a higher packing density in these active regions, as you as the sun gets more populated with active regions, you can keep it cycled. So from, from just the annihilation of opposite polarities, you would tend for these, for these fragmented fields to be to diffuse and to be, to be dissipated more effectively than the sunspot fields. So their explanation has nothing to do with the operation of dynamo. It has, it has to do with the diffusion properties of the field as the gradients between the active regions get, get larger. But there are a couple of reasons why I'm pointing out to them that their explanation cannot be correct. But one is that this, this curve that I showed you is visible much more prominently in daily data than in annually average data. So something that occurs, especially in, in fields that have, have just emerged in the sun. Okay? What's that, if, that you, if, you, if you do much. annual averages, the curves become more linear. Yes. Uh, there, I, I don't want to get into all the details of this, but basically there are observational reasons which you can essentially rule out this explanation. So in my opinion, it really has, it's, it's a result that does carry information on the source function. You know, they, in their models they call the source function the field, the, the behavior of the field when it first emerges to the photosphere. And then they use diffusion to, to act on it. So I think it's, it's, it's really telling us about the source function, which is telling us something that's dynamic. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, go on. Um, thank you so much. And you have said it already. Uh, so if I understood the first part of the talk correctly, you are saying that when the solar magnetic activity decreases, uh, the radiation in the ultraviolet will decrease, and the radiation in the uh, visible light will decrease. Well, in, well, it increases according to this result from the University of Colorado. The, the total, the, the total, okay, okay. I mean yeah, the, 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 the total irradiance goes, goes down, the total irradiance goes down, yes. and the UV goes down. Yes. But, but the, the, the green, the green and red radiation actually increase. Right. So there was a paper in Nature in recently called An Influence of Solar Spectral Radiation on Radiative Forcing of Climate. By Joanna Hayes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And they seem to present this result as a kind of path breaking or completely different from what we understand now. Yeah, I know. I, I just talked to Joanna about that. The, um, I mean, that it, you know, this is this this paper is a paper by not by solar physicists, it's by atmospheric physicists. And it's and it takes the result of the of Carter et al. And applies to applies it to the concentration of ozone. That's that's mainly what the paper is doing. Yes. But as a as a side as a side comment, the paper says that this this is a new result that has you know some bearing yes. on our yes. understanding yes. of irradiance variation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th there's what what she's saying is not inconsistent with with what I which is just told yes. you. Um, I'm just saying that the. The solar physics explanation of it, and she agrees with this now because I just talked to her once about it. The solar physics explanation of it doesn't require anything particularly groundbreaking. It just says that not only does the luminosity of the sun change, but the temperature gradient changes also. So the paper should be taken out so that this true but not very path breaking. Well, it's it's well it's it's path breaking in the in the in no. The climate research. Yeah, I mean the thing is that see she. She has a mechanism which can change climate through the act through the impact of changing ultraviolet on the stratosphere. The ozone layer. Because the ozone layer, the, the temperature gradient in the in the stratosphere is changed by the UV. And then the, the ability, the, the, 
deflection flux properties of planetary waves which carry heat from the lower from the lower latitudes to the poles can therefore change. So she's using that as a valve as a multiplier mechanism, right? And that's something that, that works even without this result from Colorado. You don't really need it. It just means that if, if their result is true, if the amplitude of the forcing of the UV on the stratosphere is somewhat increased. I really didn't understand uh, what the magnet, why the magnetic depressivity is lower than this. So, what kind of measures? Well, because if you if you ask yourself, um, what is the magnetic, what what is the heat diffusivity? My my result is not on magnetic diffusivity. It's it's on the heat diffusivity, and by implication on the magnetic diffusivity since they're dimensionally the same. So the, the, the result on the heat diffusivity is that if you compare the amplitude of the observed bright rings, then if you calculate what they should be, that what they could be, if you make the sunspot as shallow as possible, if you make it 1,000 kilometers, which will increase the, the brightness of the bright ring, right? the deeper the sunspot is, the more the heat is thrown out to the sides. So if you make the sunspot as shallow as possible, then uh, then that gives you a, an upper limit on what the heat diffusivity could be in order to produce the bright ring that's observed. Okay. But, you know, since, since we did this work, there, of course, is this whole development of the work of Nordling, you know, which says that, that this whole <coughs> way of looking at convection is completely wrong. I don't know, I mean, I, I'm sure that this is something that you people talk, hear about. You know, the, the, the idea of, of Nord Nordland is that convection in the star is not driven by the Schwarzschild criterion, by superheterophilicity from deep down. It's driven by, by radiative instability at the upper surface. Again, another example of everything happens in, in surfaces at the top. So the whole convective process is driven from the top by radiation instability. So, you know, and then all the consequences of this for the turbulent cascade and for what it really means for, for bright rings, for instance. I think in, in the context of his model, you should not have any bright rings at all. Because the sunspot is only a region where, 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 where there's no blocked heat, really. You know, just the, 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 the entropy at the bottom of the convection zone is just simply transported to the bottom of the, the sunspot. Um, the, so, in a way, you could say that if, you know, if, if you can if you can measure, if anybody can measure any bright ring around a sunspot, it's quite an interesting result because it indicates that there's a problem with how to explain it in the context of, of, uh, of Nordic model. I thought um, some five years ago there was a claim from people in Boulder, if I recall correctly, that there was a bright ring. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, they, they uh, the Mark Rast, yeah. uh, you know, and, and those people, they, they, produced, they, they, they produced bright rings which were even 10 times bigger than the ones I was telling you about here. And um, you know, I had some observational questions about the bigger one also. But, but that makes the problem even worse. The point, the point is that any bright ring that's above the noise threshold would have, would have the implications that, you know, e either you believe that the, the turbulent diffusivity idea, in which case the RAST result would mean that your diffusivity would have to be even lower the difference between the kinematic diffusivity and the, and the heat, the one that's derived from photometry would become even larger. Or if you believe the Nordland model, then you then into the problem of question that, that, that whole driving concept of Nordland. And the upper limit is this, 100 into 10, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 12. Yeah, well, uh, what have I got yeah. there? Yeah. Okay. But you know that's that's at the photosphere, so the dynamo modelers need the need the value <laughs> much different than that. Uh, regarding climate, uh, one of the other aspects that is often discussed, at least in our in our latitudes here in Scandinavia, is the connection with cosmic rays and uh, cloud coverage changes. Um, 
comments on that? Um, well, you know, I, I the, the mechanism there is something that uh, it's very complicated, and I, I I'm not an expert on that mechanism. But I think that they did some some uh, experiments mm -hmm. at CERN recently, mm -hmm. and they themselves in general too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the one problem is that there's there's a lot of controversy as to uh, which layer of clouds is being affected. Yes, so right. The basic mechanism is that you're getting nucleation of clouds yes. in a cube. And I also I think that if you if you promote the formation of low clouds, you're increasing yes. the albedo of the Earth, mm -hmm. which you should be doing. You're, you should be using high clouds, and you're actually increasing the greenhouse effect. So you have that problem in the models. It doesn't mean the model's wrong. It just means it's harder to test it. Um, but you know, one, one thing, one, one objection, or at least a principal objection to the mechanism that's been put forward is that the Earth's field disappears once in a while. And in principle, if you looked back, I think the last time that the geomagnetic field went away was somewhere like 500,000 years ago or so. Um, right now, the field is, you know, is declining rapidly, which we should be worried about it. I think the field has decreased by 10% in the last 100 years. Uh, I only learned this myself very recently. Uh, but the problem with using this disappearance of the field as a test of it, you know, you would say that, okay, when the field is no longer with us, does the, does the climate significantly different? But the ability to reconstruct climate 700,000 years ago, which is affected by the, by the ice ages, is not accurate enough to really mm -hmm. test this. Mm -hmm. this but climate. one way of testing it is uh, through the more recent, uh, con uh, more recently discovered hypothesis of the connection, which are these Forbush events, in which yeah. uh, you find um, strong cosmic ray uh, reductions during yeah. during flare, flare or cosmic ray uh, yeah. mass so I and then uh, he is, uh, Svensson is claiming that uh, at least for the strongest of these events, you can actually see immediate changes in the cloud cover within the following first six days. And if that's really true, then that is something we can test uh, in the present years during a postdoc post lifetime. I, I, thought, I, thought that has been, I thought that had been looked into and that they, they thought the results were even more conclusive. But, yeah. Yeah. but it's, it's, it's disputed. It's totally disputed. disputed. Are there any other questions? If that's not the case, then let's thank Peter okay. again. So as I said, Peter will be around for the